All right, well, in 1854, the Kansas crisis begins to develop, of course, and Brown and three of his sons, 1855, head out to Kansas. And in 1855, 56, they become involved in the Kansas Civil War. And this is probably the most, even more than Harper's Ferry, the most controversial moment of Brown's career. In 1856, after the sack of Lawrence, after pro-slavery forces had burned the city of Lawrence, Kansas, a small city, but the city of Lawrence, Kansas, the sack of Lawrence, because it was a center of anti-slavery uh, settlement, um, Brown and his sons went out into the countryside at a place called Potawatomi and murdered five pro-slavery settlers in cold blood. Uh, none of them had, had anything to do with the sack of Lawrence, but they were pro-slavery settlers, and Brown said, there's a war. This is a war. These people are kind of I guess, what are they called today? Unlawful combatants or something? Um, and uh, anyway, they murdered these five guys, and, um, and he said, look, slavery is a state of war, and we're fighters in this war of slavery against anti-slavery. Actually, Brown's action sort of invigorated a lot of, or, or the, a lot of anti-slavery settlers in Kansas, because after the sack of Lawrence, it was the first kind of response or, you know, retribution or whatever you want to call it, resistance to these violent Missourians. But there, as I said, there was no evidence that these five people had anything to do with that. So now there is a, a warrant out for Brown's arrest for murder, but nonetheless, he still travels openly back to the East. 1857, he come, he's a wanted man, but nonetheless, nobody seems to be, care about that in the North anymore. Um, he comes to Boston and he meets with a group of prominent reformers what, who come to be called the Secret Six, six prominent men who assist John Brown, at least with money. Um, Reverend Theodore Parker, important minister there, Samuel Gridley Howe, a very important re reformer, particularly on treatment of the blind and others, Jared Smith, radical abolitionist from upstate New York, <laughs> Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who will become famous as the commander of a, one of the first African-American uh, regiments in the Civil War, the first South Carolina, raised in 1862-63. Anyway, they give him money. Brown, we don't know exactly what Brown told them. I don't think he told them all that much, except I've got a plan to attack slavery. And they give him money. In 1858, he talks to Douglas again about his plan. Then he goes up to Canada, Chatham, Canada, where a lot of fugitive slaves are living by this time, and he holds a convention at which he kind of announces his plan. I mean, you know, one of the things about Brown, people knew, if they wanted to know, that Brown was planning some kind of violent assault on slavery. It wasn't really all that secret. Brown had a convention with local blacks. He presented a provisional constitution for the liberated areas of the United States. He was going to liberate parts and have a new kind of constitution. And um, he would be the commander in chief, of course. And a couple of African Americans from, not that many, a couple of them decided to join Brown on this venture back in the United States. 1859, he's back in the US. He's in Maryland, just over the border from um, Virginia, Western Virginia, uh, on a farm, planning his attack on Harper's Ferry. Douglas visits him on his farm in 1859. Brown says to him, Brown explains his plan now, as it now exists. Doug, he says to Douglas, you got to come with me. When I strike, the bees will swarm, the slaves, and I need a queen bee. I need a leader, a black leader, to be there to mobilize the slaves. That's you. Douglas says, forget it. I'm not going anywhere. He says, I told him that all his arguments and his descriptions of the place convinced me he was going into a perfect steel trap, and once in, he would never get out alive. So Douglas does not go, which he later, not that he regrets not going, but he kind of is a little embarrassed about it in his memoir, just because here's a guy who's willing to go to the utmost, Brown, and put his life on the line, 
and Douglas doesn't. So, for you know, in a, for good reason. Anyway, October sixteenth, eighteen fifty nine. John Brown and 21 men, five of them African American, the rest white, leave his farm, cross over to Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Harpers Ferry, it's now West Virginia. Here is a picture of Harpers Ferry. It's a very bucolic place. In fact, you can't, it, the, the, <laughs> the town and the arsenal are just over here. There's the Potomac River, and it's a beautiful area. It's now in the state of West Virginia. It's not all that far from Washington, actually. If you ever find yourself in that neck of the woods, stop in. It's a very interesting place. But um, it was the site of a federal arsenal. In other words, they had a lot of guns there for whatever use they might be in the future. Their big warehouse or arsenal full of weapons. So that's the target. He leaves his farm. He leaves behind all his correspondence with these secret six. Was that just inadvertence? No. Brown is a clever guy. If he fails, he doesn't want people to just say, well, this is one lone guy. He implicates the others. He knows that stuff will be discovered. He wants people to, he wants the South to know there are more than just one willing to support a, you know, stand behind an action like this, okay? The Secret Six were annoyed. Let me just put it that way. So Brown and his men overrun the, far, the arsenal. There's only, there's only a couple of guards. They're taken by surprise. They seize the arsenal. And then they stay there. They hold it. They do not retreat up into the mountains, like Brown had, been, had said years before. Why? Maybe they're waiting for slaves to join them. Maybe the slaves will hear about this and rise up. Nobody knows. But very quickly, they're surrounded by the local militia. And within a day, and then some federal troops head there under the command of Colonel Robert E. Lee of Virginia marches up to Harpers Ferry, but very quickly this whole thing falls apart. They're surrounded, they're either captured or killed. Five of them actually manage to escape, ten are killed, and seven more are captured. And all of those seven are executed uh, a little bit later, including John Brown. So this is, there's Harpers Ferry, and that, in a, in a nutshell, that's John Brown's raid. It doesn't seem like a gigantic thing, but it has a lot of, um, Impact. Now, some people say, well, John Brown is just a litany of mistakes. Look at all the mistakes John Brown made. He let a train go through. How did people know? He cut the telegraph wires, but a train came through the Baltimore, Ohio, and he let it go through to Baltimore. And at the next station, the train conductor sort of sounded the alarm, and that's how the militia started coming, etc. He expected slaves to rise up, but he had not done anything to notify slaves or spread word that he was coming, and actually there weren't any slaves. West Virginia had almost no slaves. That's why it seceded from Virginia during the Civil War. This is not a plantation area. This is a mountainous area with small, poor white farming, and I think only about 5% of the population of, that, of West Virginia up there was slaves. So it's not really the place to have, expect a giant slave insurrection. Um, he didn't bring a lot of supplies, actually. Uh, in fact, they had to get uh, food from a local inn sent in, you know, sort of like Ollie's. They'd call up and say, send me a few, you know. <laughs> or the movie, ever see the old movie by Woody Allen, Bananas? Where he, it's sort of like that in Bananas, where he's a, you know, a guerrilla fighter in Latin America. He has to send out for like a thousand tons of coleslaw and stuff for his army and all this. So anyway, John Brown had to get breakfast delivered from the local inn at his thing. Um, so, uh, all right, so you could just say, oh, what a terrible series of errors. But there are others who say, well, what, do you th what was John Brown's aim, actually? Was it to have a successful military uh, incursion? Maybe, maybe. That, it, certainly if it worked, that's fine. But um, others say, no, he was an intentional martyr. It wasn't a mistake. He knew that this, that this was going to happen. He knew they would be captured or killed. But maybe he was sort of himself as sort of like Jesus Christ, who sacrificed 
himself for the sins of mankind, maybe. Or maybe in a more secular way, he thought that, well, a, a, an African-American Canadian who had met him up there later said, John Brown, I think, never communicated his whole um, plan, even to his immediate followers. In, this, in his conversations with me, he led me to think that he intended to sacrifice himself and a few of his followers for the purpose of arousing the people of the North for the stupor they were in on this subject. He felt the people of the North were in a stupor about, were comatose about the question of slavery and his violent action, even if he completely failed, was going to galvanize public opinion and wake them up. That, now, so maybe, or maybe, maybe the simplest thing is he put himself in a no-lose situation. If it succeeded, maybe slaves, local slaves, would rise up and his plan would succeed fine. If it didn't succeed, the violent act itself would galvanize public opinion, maybe. Anyway, if that was his aim, it was a godsend, A, that he was captured and not killed, because then he was put on trial in Virginia. He was charged, oddly enough, with treason against the state of Virginia, which is an odd charge, because he was not a Virginian. He had never pledged allegiance to Virginia or anything like that. They charged him with treason against Virginia. All right, that was the charge. Um, he knew very well, now he's wounded, and he's in the courthouse, or he's in the, you know, the court on a stretcher, basically, during the trial. Um, he knew the trial was a center of national attention. The media, as it existed then, i.e. newspapers from all over the country, sent people to report on John Brown's trial. And he seized the opportunity to create his own image. What was the image? It was the image of a peace-loving man who was inspired by the Bible to help the unfortunate. He did not intend murder. He did not intend violence. His only motivation was to liberate the oppressed, inspired by the words of the Bible. And in his final speech, you see some of this in GNAP as well as the, um, some of the reactions. His final speech, he said, well, a great document actually. He says, I deny everything but what I have all along admitted, the design on my part to free the slaves. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children, some of his children have been killed over the last few years, um, and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, let it be done. So he's, he's sacrificing himself for mankind and... This is the image that survives, at least in the north, of John Brown. 